edition of No Mercy with yours truly, Stephen A. Smith, coming at you at the very least every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Check wherever you hear your podcast, and you obviously will be able to find No Mercy. Except this time, you'll be able to see it because today is the day we debut on video. Courtesy of YouTube, obviously, go to the Stephen A. Smith Podcast YouTube channel, and that's where you could see me from this day moving forward. I've been on audio since September, September 26th to be exact, until this day. But as of today, I will be on video, obviously, for the foreseeable future. It is something that I've waited for quite some time because the age that we're living in, it's about the visual. The visual matters just as much, if not more, than the audio. Audio is important. But the video is all that in a bag of chips, as I like to say. By the way, while I'm sitting here in studio, let me give a special thanks to our official studio sponsor, FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel is the official sports betting company of this No Mercy podcast with yours truly. Again, Stephen A. Smith. I got a lot to get into. And there's a lot that I want to touch on here. Because to start off this podcast on video... January 9th, 2023, New Year, New Day, New Year's resolution. My resolution was basically to be every bit as more impactful than I have been. It's about the climb. It's about moving on up. And it's about doing so to be an inspiration, to serve as an example, as a model of some of the good things. We saw in the world of sports, no surprise there, something along those lines over the last week. Just a week ago, on Monday Night Football, on ESPN, the home of my day job, we saw a guy by the name of DeMar Hamlin nearly lose his life. In what appeared to be a routine tackle of wide receiver T. Higgins of the Cincinnati Bengals, T. Higgins was running with the football, hit Hamlin in the chest while Hamlin was getting ready to tackle him. Hamlin took him down, tackled him, got up, and then immediately collapsed on the field in front of his teammates, his contemporaries, a packed house of over 50 to 60,000 fans, and a nationwide audience of millions. We saw medical professionals from both the Buffalo Bills and the Cincinnati Bengals come rushing out. And when we saw that, then we saw independent medical professionals joining them. From there, everything was a blur. We had to be told that CPR was performed on him, not once, but twice. We had to be told that essentially he nearly died on the field, that he had to be resuscitated. Ultimately, an ambulance came. They took him off the field. But so many people were so shook by what had transpired there was a lengthy debate that was ongoing as to whether or not the game should be played, should continue to be played. This happened in the first quarter with a little under six minutes left in the first quarter. That's when this took place with the Cincinnati Bengals up seven to three. And the debate went on and on and on for a little while. I saw colleagues like Adam Schefter and Booger McFarlane with Susie Colbert doing an exceptional job of trying to explain what was transpiring and trying to keep the audience alert and in tune with what was transpiring. As they got the information, so did the public. We saw Joe Buck and Troy Aikman do the same from the booth because they were calling the game. We saw tears streaming down the faces of teammates like Stefan Diggs and others. We saw collective prayer on a part of the Buffalo Bills. Cincinnati Bengals incredibly concerned. We heard about the mother of Stefan Diggs coming from the stands. I'm sorry, the mother of DeMar Hamlin coming from the stands. She was in attendance for the game. He's 24 years old. 
It's a sixth round pick. He was starting because obviously he had taken over the starting safety spot because of injuries to a couple of other starters for the Buffalo Bills. And he was doing a damn good job. And we went from all of that to wondering whether or not a 24-year-old kid wearing an NFL uniform was going to lose his life. And regardless of the debate that ensued subsequently, what we ultimately found out was what we've been reminded of throughout history. The hearts, the souls, the minds of human beings across this nation. We heard about a toy drive that he had when he wanted to generate just $2,500 for kids. Ladies and gentlemen, that number has now exceeded $8 million. From $2,500 to $8 million. We saw a collaborative effort on the part of the Buffalo Bills and the Cincinnati Bengals. We saw NFL contemporaries of DeMar Hamlin across the nation sending well wishes and prayers. We saw my colleague, my brother, Ryan Clark, damn near in tears, speaking about this man. We also saw the same from Marcus Spears. The list went on and on and on. And it was a reminder of what we hear and what we see in the world of sports. What is not appreciated enough as far as I'm concerned. You see, I couldn't wait to talk about this. I couldn't wait. Because when we look at the professional athletes, it's mo- it, it takes moments like this in order for us to reflect upon something that's obvious in front of our face every day. When we're looking for togetherness, when we're looking for cohesiveness, when we're looking to be like-minded, to have a universal agenda, for the betterment of the whole, sports is where we usually look. That's where we find it. Think about it for a second. You're on a football field. You're trying to win. Think about how many different positions there are. There's a quarterback. There's running backs. There's fullbacks. There's tight ends. This wide receivers, there's an offensive line. On that offensive line, you got guards, you got tackles. You got centers. On the defensive side of the ball, what do you have? You got a nose tackle. You got defensive ends. You got defensive tackles. You got safeties, free and strong safeties. You got cornerbacks. Different positions all over the place. You got people who play offense. You got people who play defense. You got people who play special teams. You got a head coach. You got an offensive coordinator. You got a defensive coordinator. You got a special teams coordinator. Hell, you even have somebody who's devoid of a damn title following the coaches around carrying the cables that's attached to their head. We don't even know what his position is. We got medical professionals. We got strength and conditioning coaches. We got team managers. We got equipment managers. We got public relations. We got media relations. We got GMs. We got player personnel directors. We got scouts. Look at all of these positions that I brought up. All are working towards one goal. One. For their organization and their team to win. Sports has been the mosaic. As a nation, we pride ourselves on being, supposedly. But where has it been anywhere else? You didn't think you were going to get away. With me not mentioning what the hell happened on Capitol Hill this week, did you? Or last week, I apologize. Ladies and gentlemen, an election took place in early November. We saw the Republicans win the House. The Democrats maintain the Senate. We saw runoffs in Georgia. 
with Raphael Warnock holding on to his seat against Herschel Walker. Thank God. But I digress. We saw all of that. And here we are in a new year in January. And the Republicans. With Kevin McCarthy supposedly being the speaker of the house. And it was supposed to be a foregone conclusion. 15 damn roll calls. 15. 15 damn roll calls. Before. He was confirmed as Speaker of the House and allowed to swear in the other Republicans who had won re-election or won election and was scheduled to be in office. We got issues all over the place. We got a recession that's arguably impending. We got inflation that's arguably scheduled to kick in. We got issues at the border. We got deficits to address. We got crime all over the streets of America. Just the other day, a teacher was shot in Newport News, Virginia by a six-year-old. A six-year-old. That's the kind of stuff that's going on in America, but these people can't make a decision about their own damn party. 200 to 201 people are siding with Kevin McCarthy, but a holdout of 20 to 21 held up everything and left the nation wondering what the hell they were going to do. The Democrats were sitting in the damn House chamber saying we, we, there's nothing we can do until they pick a speaker. But sports figures are held to a higher standard. Can anybody explain that? Can anybody explain how somebody wearing pads and a helmet or a jersey in their 20s with no ability whatsoever to legislate the lives of American people are held to a higher standard than our elected officials. Can anybody explain that? Take your time. I'll wait. I'll wait. Because it's embarrassing. As it pertains to our politics. As it pertains to our sports. It's the latest example about how no matter how hard we try to marginalize, minimize, and demonize these young men, holding them responsible and accountable for their supposed contribution to the betterment of our society. These folks in the world of sports live up to it far better than what anybody else does. Think about that. Because I got more to say. I'm just getting started. You're listening to No Mercy with Stephen A. Don't touch that dial. Don't change the channel. Don't go anywhere. This is where it all begins, baby. I'm on video now. You could see me. You thought I was dangerous before. You ain't seen a damn thing yet. More No Mercy with George Truly in a minute. You know, <clears throat> we live in different times. There's no question about it. I mean, you've got mega Republicans on the, on the extreme right. On the extreme left, we've got this woke culture, per se. And we understand its relevancy in that regard because you got to watch everything that you say, how it's interpreted, how it's going to be surmised, et cetera, et cetera. And you got to be careful. And I understand that. And there are some people who will remain nameless. The timing of their remarks 
is what threw everybody off. Because there's a time and a place for everything in a lot of people's minds, and we all know that. So when DeMar Hamlin goes down and he's on the field fighting for his life, that's not the time to talk about football in the eyes of many. In the eyes of a few, they might think differently. And there's going to be a plethora of people out there who get into some kind of uproar because how dare anybody think about it? How dare anybody think about it? I mean, did you see what happened to him? Oh, my God. It's so incredibly violent. All true. But then have you looked at history? Just a few weeks earlier, Tua Tungvaloa got hit. The quarterback for the Miami Dolphins, Tua Tungvaloa, got hit on the same field that DeMar Hamlin went down in, in Cincinnati, to a place for the Miami Dolphins. He went down, and it looked like rigor mortis kicked in. His body stiffened up. His fingers curled awkwardly. And you know what happened to Tua Tungvaloa? He was carried off the field in an ambulance. Do you know what happened after that? The game continued. That couldn't happen the other night. Let me be very clear about that. Now, I'm not going to get into too many details. But as somebody who's in the world of sports, as a sports commentator and pundit, and obviously I've been a reporter for over 25 years, I can tell you that blood was coming out of his nose and his mouth. He was not breathing. If DeMar Hamlin had not been treated on the spot by those experts, those medical professionals for the Buffalo Bills and the Cincinnati Bengals, DeMar Hamlin would be dead. There is not a single medical professional that would disagree with what I just said because I got it from them. He'd be dead. A football field led by those professionals who have been training all year long in the offseason for such emergencies, led by Troy Vincent, the executive VP of the NFL Players Association, who I've also spoken to, by the way. And the NFL in collaboration with the NFL Players Association, who ensured that the players would receive the medical expertise they richly deserve. Their collaborative efforts is what, is, is what ensured that, those situa that that situation could have been dealt with the way that it was. But there's a reason that you have them in place. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the fact of the matter is, football is an incredibly violent sport. As is the UFC, MMA, as is boxing. We've seen people seriously injured before. We've even seen death. Now, on a football field, just making sure to look at my notes to make sure I have this guy's name right here. Charles Frederick Hughes, wide receiver, National Football League, 1967 to 1971, playing a game as a Detroit Lion against the Chicago Bears. Ladies and gentlemen, on the football field, he collapsed right in front of Dick Butkus the legendary linebacker for the Chicago Bears, right in front of him. And, Buck, and Butkus waved frantically for them to come over and help him. They got him to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. To this day, that is the only player that has ever perished on a football field. Daryl Stingley didn't die on a football field. He would die later from complications of heart disease and pneumonia stemming from his quadriplegia. But remember, Jack Tatum, formerly of the Oakland Raiders, that assassin in a preseason game hit Daryl Stingley, the wide receiver, as he was coming over the middle and rendered him a quadriplegic. It's one of the most vicious hits we've ever seen in NFL history. 
in the years to follow, we've seen concussions, we've seen big hits, we've seen all of these things. But I'm just talking about where that was true paralysis. My brother, my friend, the playmaker himself, Michael Irvin, laid still on a football field at Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania years ago. And for moments, they thought he was paralyzed. Football is a violent sport. Boxing is a violent sport. MMA, UFC, that's a violent sport. People watch anyway. And I had one of my writers, Sherry, she's phenomenal, Sherry McCovey, and she comes to me and she's like, hey, what's the violence, the violence? Why do people so gravitate to the violence, the violence? What is that about? Michael, the left-wing zealot that he is, my guy. What is the, the violence, Stephen? It was the violence. I mean, it's got to stop. Where does it end? Where does it end? You know what the answer is? Never. It's uncomfortable to say, isn't it? Uncomfortable to hear, isn't it? The answer is never. Ladies and gentlemen, back in the day, before there were billion-dollar stadiums being built by Jerry Jones and, and places like SoFi Stadium and other places, long before that existed, violent sports were in play. One of the things that I have a dream about, it was one of the things on my bucket list, is I've never been to Italy. You know, a lot of people, especially Catholics, everybody want to go to the Vatican. They want to go to the Vatican. Okay? Me? I've always wanted to see the Roman Colosseum. That's what I want to see. Roman Colosseum, ladies and gentlemen, one of my favorite all-time movies is The Gladiator with Russell, you know, Russell Crowe. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius. Loyal servant to the true emperor, Marcus Aurelius. Father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife. And I shall have my vengeance in this life or the next. Jacqueline Phoenix, the villain who killed his own father in the movie Gladiator. One of the greatest movies I've ever seen in my life. And I'm sitting there looking at them. Who are they fighting? They're fighting other gladiators. They're fighting tigers. Okay, they're fighting other criminals. And the king is sitting up giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down for you to be killed. That ain't going on in the year 2023. Be happy with what you got. Violence in sports is not going anywhere. You know why? Because they'll tell you, A, it's controlled. B, we're not promoting someone's death. And C, there's too much money involved because the NFL is a multi-billion dollar establishment. Fighters like Floyd Money Mayweather have become damn near billionaires because of boxing. The UFC is worth what once purchased for $2 million is now worth over $9 billion. And last but not least, because the athletes participating in the sport have done so voluntarily. When you have that element, it's not going anywhere. No matter what we say. So all of the pomp and circumstance, all of the noise, all of everything that everybody was talking about, of course we praying Hamlin's going to be all right. Of course we were praying that he would survive. Of course we're ecstatic that not only has he survived, but the tube has been taken out of him and he's breathing on his own now. And he's communicating now. And he's giving Zoom calls to the Buffalo Bills. And he's asking doctors that we win the game. And they're happy. Just be, under, just be clear. Had the worst happened, there would have still been NFL playoff games. You can book it. So we got to stop acting like certain things are going anywhere. I live in a real pragmatic world. I don't live 
on Fantasy Island. There's no Dr. York that I know. There's no little dude running around. They're playing, Buzz. They're playing, they're playing. I don't know that person in real life. I live in the real world. Sports ain't going anywhere. Even with its occasional violence. It's not going anywhere. They sat up there and they said somebody getting tackled at full speed is like getting hit by a car going 50 to 56 miles an hour. Which one of y'all running out in the street to get hit by a car going 50 to 56 miles an hour? But you go to the stadium or turn on your TV to watch it happen every week. Stop the nonsense. You're not going to stop watching. And the NFL knows it. That's why Amazon got Thursday night football. That's why YouTube just spent $2 billion for the Sunday NFL ticket package. It's why the NFL, NB, it's why CBS, Fox, NBC, and ESPN slash ABC all have a contract with the National Football League. They're not going anywhere. They're not going anywhere. Because we don't want them to. We want them right there. I'd get rid of every one of these politicians if I could. We're stuck with these dudes. You got some elected official that just got sworn in with his pudgy self. Some Republican rep out of New York, he lied about everything. Ladies and gentlemen, he even lied about his name. He lied about where he went to school. He lied about what job titles he had. He lied about everything. There was a protest trying to rescind him being sworn in because of all the damn lies he told. And there's nothing we can do. You got Matt Getz, representative out of Florida, sitting there leading a pack of 20 to 25 people to hold up government with their failure to elect the Speaker of the House because they wanted to be on committees and they wanted to have a stronger voice in terms of curtailing spending instead of approving what they believe is exorbitant spending by President Joe Biden and the White House. And the Democrats on Capitol Hill. And I'm not saying they're wrong. I don't know. That's not where I'm going. I'm saying when chaos leads to paralysis of a government overseeing 350 million Americans. That is problematic. And it's even worse. When more fervor is thrown in the direction of a Kyrie Irving. Thrown into the direction of a Colin Kaepernick. Thrown into the correct into the direction of a sports or, or some kind of athlete or someone from the sports world. While this stuff flies under the radar. Stuff that's really dramatically affecting the American people and the lives we strive to live. This is why you can have politicians all over the place. None of them will ever measure up to Muhammad Ali. None of them will ever mention measure up to Bill Russell. None of them will ever measure up to the plethora of dudes who did not lean on jest performing on the field or the court of play. Let me throw Arthur Ashe into that as well. Let me throw Kurt Flood into that as well. Let me throw Billie Jean King into that as well. It ain't all just black folks. It's about serving a higher purpose. Y'all want to ignore what sports figures have brought to our world. 
That's shameful. What's worse is that the people who are really supposed to be making our society and our world better are the ones dropping the ball on purpose. And to that, y'all say nothing. Now that's a damn shame. It truly, truly, truly is. But I ain't finished. I got a little bit more to close out the show in just a minute. Stick around. It's No Mercy with Stephen A. On video! I'm not hiding. You know, <clears throat> we sit up here and we talk about a lot of things. I know I'm not going to hesitate to do it. I want the world to have a greater appreciation for the sports world. The fact that while some may assume it's a microcosm of society, all of us should assume it should be. Togetherness, coming together for a common goal, winning being the priority, fair and equitable play. You can't win a basketball game playing football rules or vice versa. Golf doesn't apply to tennis. Basketball games don't apply to baseball. The rules are not hidden through some proverbial glass ceiling. It's right there for everybody to be subjected to and held accountable for. I'm able to decipher whether you can play or not based on the rules of the game and who excels under that umbrella and who doesn't. That is a fair and equitable society to live under. And if it comes with this share of violence, I don't wish it, but I understand it. One of the greatest events I've ever participated, I've, I've ever been a part of when I went to, I was in attendance for it, was Deontay Wilder fighting Tyson Fury. I saw Deontay Wilder in the trilogy, that is. I saw him look finished. In round three, I thought he was done. I thought it was over. He survived. I was shocked. And I said, ain't no way in hell he getting out of the fourth round. He don't have it no more. I mean, Tyson Fury was about 38 pounds heavier than him. And every punch that he hit him with, it was that weight behind it. And even when he missed, he fell on him. He leaned on him. Just, just, that, just that blob. The blob that he was. Just leaning on him. And I said, Tyson, Deontay Wilder can't survive this. And then lo and behold, when I thought the fight was over, Deontay Wilder caught him with a right. And the next thing you know, I saw Tyson Fury come tumbling down. We were shocked. He got up. Deontay Wilder put him down again. I said, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I can't believe this. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. And then obviously he got up. And then he ultimately took Deontay Wilder out in the 11th round. But it was an epic fight. We know that Deontay Wilder wasn't healthier because of it. We were thrilled anyway. We've seen Mike Tyson literally target putting somebody's nose into their brain. And although it makes us cringe and we're scared to death, every time he was on pay-per-view, we watched, didn't we? Did we? That's what we wanted to see. And at the end of the day, you've got people looking at these sports figures and we're marveling at their greatness. But when the event is over and when the applause dies down and we get to come down from the high they provided, then we want to hold them accountable for doing stuff that grown ass adults won't do. We got people on Capitol Hill. I've said this to y'all before, I'll say it again. They don't have to work. The work is for the campaign. Once you finish campaigning and you're elected to office, tell me what work you have to do in this day and age. All you have to do is vote on the side you're representing. If you're a Republican, all you got to do is pull a lever for whatever your side wants you to vote on. 
That's it. You don't even have to read bills. You don't even have to know what the legislation entails. All you have to do is side with it. When they wanted to bring Herschel Walker into office, Rashawn, listen to me, I'm talking to you. Because you're down there in Georgia. Now this is a black man in Herschel Walker that felt, that felt it was a compliment to be called a coon. Literally. Go look at the tapes. Go look at the tapes. That's what he said. It was a compliment. It wasn't it an insult, a compliment to me. Have you, do you know what a coon, you know how smart a coon is? This is what the man said. This was after the, the, the dirty air is going to mix with the clean air in America. And, and that clean air is going to get contaminated by that dirty air from China. And, 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 and we got to get rid of it. That Herschel Walker. That dude. I mean, it would be hilarious if it wasn't so damn sad and scary. Do you have any idea how scared black people were that he was going to win? You have any idea how petrified black Americans in this country were, were, were going to feel? Now, there's certain people that we feel like they just taking us back to a different time. I'm talking about to the time of the cotton fields. That's how we felt about Herschel Walker. Not Herschel Walker, the football player. Now, Herschel Walker, I'm sure uh, 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 some people say a decent human being. I'm talking about the, the Herschel Walker candidate we saw. That dude. But we also knew that you'd have Republicans everywhere supporting him because he was simply going to do what they told him to do. Pull this lever right here on the ride and just pull it back this way. And that's all you need to do. And show up to Capitol Hill from Georgia when we ask you to. That's all. That's what our politics have been reduced to. And as a result, there's no accountability. And if there's no accountability from Capitol Hill, ultimately it's going to trickle down to there being limited accountability everywhere else. Because we're going to look at our society and we're going to say, who the hell are y'all to tell us anything? I ain't mentioning na names, but we had politicians on Capitol Hill making noise in front of the cameras who had been accused of being involved in sex trafficking violations. Or sex trafficking, rather, because that is a violation. We had all types of nonsense going on. But when Kyrie made his mistake, you had cats ready to end his career. Colin Kaepernick took a knee. Didn't boycott games. Didn't impede the progress of the games. Didn't prevent the start of the games. Did nothing. Just exercised his right as an American citizen to kneel during the national anthem. And his career is over. It's a beautiful thing that we've seen the world come together in the immediate situation involving DeMar Hamlin and the ultimate aftermath. Because folks came together and they said, yo, human being first. We just want this man, this young man to be okay. We want his mother to be able to hug a child full of life instead of a lifeless child she'd have to say goodbye to. We want his daddy to be there and speak and address the Buffalo Bills on Zoom about how thankful he is for their love and support as opposed to planning a funeral. Had something happened to DeMar Hamlin, the NFL community would have been shook to its core. It would have devastated a lot of people. We would have lamented what's going on with the National Football League. Did they have enough medical professionals there? What about these guys' lives 
once their careers are over? Do they have the proper medical coverage and medical insurance? Is enough money being poured into that? These retired players, are we taking care of them? All of that other stuff. I got news for you, ladies and gentlemen. DeMar Hamlin did not die. He is alive and doing well and better every single day. We should still be addressing those issues. We should still be addressing those issues. But chances are we probably won't. Not nearly as much as we should. And the games will go on. And you know why? Because we can't take our eyes off of it. You watched the games yesterday on Sunday, didn't you? Tell the truth, didn't you? You gonna watch Monday Night Football, ain't you? Playoffs begin this weekend. You damn sure ain't gonna miss that, are you? You know you're not. But I tell you what could help us all. Start being about the business of accountability across the board. Because if you develop the habit of holding those accountable who need to be held accountable for whatever job description their respective positions may entail, then it will be pure habit to do the same everywhere. And no one will feel like inequity exists and they're being unfairly treated. But until then, remember this, the sports world, specifically the National Football League, is here to stay. And you should be thankful and grateful because it wouldn't exist as fruitful as it is, as financially exorbitant and beneficial as it is, if it were not for you supporting the product to begin with. You own it just like everybody else. I'm not telling you not to. I'm just saying own everything else in the process. Just the same way you monitor these young 20 plus year olds for every little thing they do. Do the same to the people legislating our lives. Find our priorities and see where it takes us. We might be surprised. It'll help make us all better. Certainly help make the world a better place. That's it for the debut of this podcast. No Mercy with Stephen A. Smith. Thank you for joining me. Remember, I'll be on a minimum of three days a week, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the very least. Right here, No Mercy with Stephen A. Smith, wherever you can find your podcast. By the way, I got my memoir. I got my memoir coming out. It's a book. No Mercy. That's the name of the podcast, but this is Straight Shooter. That's right. You see it. A memoir of second chances and first takes. My book. Never wrote a book before. I have now. It comes out on bookshelves January 17th. You can pre-order it now at straightshooterbook.com. That's straightshooterbook.com. Some of the same messages I spewed today. You'll read in the book. Obviously, it's significantly more detailed in regards to my life itself. I hope you will bless me with buying the book and reading it for yourself. I hope it serves as a form of motivation and inspiration for you. Make sure you check it out. That was my intent, my goal when I wrote it. So I hope it pulls that off. Either way, I'll be back with you in just a couple of days, right here on No Mercy with Stephen A. Smith. Remember, you don't have to know sports to know mercy. Remember I said that. You'll be hearing that from me a lot. Until next time, everybody. Peace and love. 